Kia ora tato. No Dunedin aho. Ko naite rangi te iwi. Ko Dave aho. Tena koto. Tena koto. Tena koto kato. Grant, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's um, it's very humbling to hear all those things. I mean, I guess I did provide your office with a lot of the information, so it's sort of <laughs> it's, a, it's a Trumpy kind of humble, but you know, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, geez, there's a lot of people here tonight, um, and and what is genuinely humbling is just the number of friends who are here tonight as well. People, you know, from my my past, my present. I hope my future it depends maybe which which pictures are put in here but um no there are, there are people here tonight who have known me just about since this phase well my mum and dad who did know me at, at this point in time um but they were really the only ones initially because i was born in canada um my dad was at the university of toronto studying his phd on james joyce's ulysses um and well so that's where i was born uh, he used to come home actually and regale me with thrilling anecdotes from his research um, <laughs> So it's been a while coming, Dad, but payback got there. Um, there's other people. We moved back to New Zealand when I was four, um, and I got to meet my wider family, or to, to re-meet in some cases, um, people like my Uncle Paul, who had actually made the trip over to Canada to visit us. Um, so Paul's here tonight with his wife, Anne, and you know, really touched that you guys came down from Auckland. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, when we did come to New Zealand, Paul took it on himself to introduced me to the, the great outdoors, which I took to immediately. Um, and I appreciate the sentiment. Uh, um, we moved to Dunedin after coming back from Canada. Uh, and I was very lucky, I think, to grow up in the middle of a circle of very close friends, again, some of whom are, he are here tonight. Um, and within that circle were a couple of kids my, my own age who I, I grew up with. Um, there's Cassandra here. Um, some people may not recognised, but may know John Mathewson, uh, who is actually based at Massey Albany now, has contributed to our philosophy teaching program here at Vic over a, a large number of years. Um, and all in all, actually, I had a pretty sweet gig going uh, as an only child. Uh, you can see, look at the, the care and attention in that gingerbread cake. I mean, oh, mum, <laughs> work of art. Um, but, you know, all good things come to an end. <laughs> and then it was sort of short shorts and giant home heads for me from then on in. Um, so this is my sister Katya, um, lurking up the front. <laughs> um, she's always been very good actually at uh, diverting all the attention, so don't look at her um, right now. But, but here she is out prettying the PM at some exotic locale um, as she rises up through the ranks at uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and Trade. And mum wasn't done yet. Uh, after a second marriage, she went on to have two more kids, you know, my brother Nick and Sophie down here. So I knew I was going to have to work pretty damn hard to get the spotlight back where it belonged uh, on me. Seems to have worked out, though. <laughs> anyway, um, it wasn't obvious that the way of getting the spotlight back on me was going to be in any way science related, um, because despite some early evidence of curiosity driven research, um, <laughs> Really, I had no interest in science whatsoever. Um, and that actually got pointed out quite clearly. Sorry, Elizabeth, I know you're sick of, of hearing this, but um, my mum at this stage was a languages teacher at Kaikoura Valley High School in Dunedin, and one of her science teacher colleagues, and it has been mentioned before, mention it again, described me as being as scientific as a wet sock. Uh, but she was eminently justified. No one, no one actually, it's fair to say, disagreed uh, at the time. Um, and I was least of, least of all I had any interest in biology, um, none at all, because as far as I was concerned it was going out into the great outdoors, and you've seen how I felt about that, um, and drawing things, it was just basically drawing, and I'm terrible at drawing, absolutely atrocious, um, and I'm not just bad at it, the things I try and draw don't seem to bear a heck of a lot of a resemblance to, to reality, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I've provided a translation for anyone who can't read it, but <laughs> dear daddy, I went to the farm with Max, rocket and I don't think it's arugula um, so um, yeah I mean the, to be fair by the time I started high school I, I thought it was reasonably clear that I was following in my parents footsteps uh, with humanities uh, English was definitely my my favorite subject at high school um, but what I found to my dismay is that well my handwriting clearly is terrible I mean I was 14 when I composed that essay <laughs> but I'm also really really slow it took me about 10 minutes to write it um, and what I found is that when we had school cert, for, that used to be a thing for those of you who can remember, um, I just couldn't finish the essays in time uh, to do well. So 
once I found out that science was, at least at high school, was predominantly multi-choice, you know, I was, I was hooked. I jumped walkers straight away. Um, but I was always adamant, even though I was well into science, I guess, at this stage, that I was never going to do a PhD. And you can see my response to trying on my uh, stepfather Alan's robes uh, at this point, you know, not really that convinced about the whole thing. Uh, and at the time, it was a bit disappointing. I mean, as I was supposed to be putting these slides together and all the rest of it, um, digging through photos and all the rest of it, um, I spent a lot more time doing that than actually putting slides together. But I had a really hard time finding photos from my high school years and early university years. Um, and I'm not sure where they are. There's ones I can definitely remember probably taking. Um, but anyway, at the time, I was much more interested in playing hockey and playing bridge. Uh, and that's the, the card game. Um, and at least for the, on the bridge side, I was able to fill into some gaps for some really important friends, uh, courtesy of the Otago Bridge Club website, which they maintain really, really well. Although I'm not thrilled, to be honest, with the photo that they've chosen to make the number two hit if anyone Google searches me, you know, any incoming students trying to find out just how cool their, <laughs> their new professor is going to be, uh, and the answer being not very. And the answer to the other question you're asking, probably, uh, is actually no, I didn't have a girlfriend at that <laughs> point in time. Um, I had a harder time finding hockey photos, um, so what I've got here are some photos of some important hockey and hockey adjacent uh, friends of, of the time, and you just have to take my word for it that AstroTurf and hockey sticks were involved somewhere along the line. Um, I suppose you have to take, there's no evidence of cards in these photos, but to be honest, who's going to lie about having been well into bridge as a teenager, so I think you'll, you'll probably trust me there. Um, this slide, I'm afraid, ends on a bit of a sombre note, so Jules here, Julian Melton, Jules um, was a really good high school friend, he was a good hockey friend, uh, later he was a good postgraduate biochemistry friend. Uh, he passed away at the age of only 31 from stomach cancer, so I just wanted to acknowledge Jules uh, in this talk. And it's fair to say, unfortunately, that cancer's actually not been very kind to my family. Um, there's a number of people who can't be here tonight um, Yeah, for, for that reason. So this is my auntie Janice, who uh, all of the cousins on my dad's side, of which there are a vast number, um, we're not Catholic, we might as well be, um, and um, loved Auntie Janice, she was just a fantastic lady. Um, there's my uncle Paul, dad's brother, who was part of the 1976 uh, Montreal gold medal winning Olympic team, and I just absolutely idolised him as a kid growing up, I idolised him as an adult, you know, he was just a wonderful guy on and off the field. Uh, there's my grandparents on my dad's side, grandparents on my mum's side, and then most recently, and cruelest of all, just a couple of months ago, uh, our 13-year-old niece passed away from a, a brain tumour that no one knew that she had. So, as Grant said, you know, some of the research that we've been doing uh, in my lab is cancer-related, and the majority of these people actually passed away after I started here at Victoria University from cancer-related um, issues. And I, it's genuinely reframed the way that I, I guess I look at a lot of the work that we're doing. And on a good day, that's a very motivational thing, uh, you know, on a bad day, it feels like we're a very, very long way from actually making a difference to, to anyone. And for very good reasons, of course, you know, any new treatment um, has to be tested thoroughly, very rigorous safety trials, very rigorous efficacy trials. But there's also a huge number of roadblocks that you can't necessarily do anything about. Um, and particularly when you're working on, and I'll, I'll get to this a bit later on, something like cancer gene therapy, where there are so many moving parts, and it's new and it's exciting, but it's also highly experimental. Um, the things that need to be addressed to actually turn that into a reality are very profound indeed, and I won't have time to, to go into them all, but you know, it does, you wish you could do a bit more. Anyway, as Grant said, um, I guess the unifying theme of my talk tonight is going to be work on direct evolution. And you can't really talk about evolution without talking about the guy who invented it, Mr. Darwin there on the left. At least I'm sure, according to one of my students who said that Watson and Crick invented DNA, um, that would be the, the summation. <laughs> Set up a bit of a chicken and egg scenario that really hurt my head to, to kind of think about. But anyway, um, Darwin didn't invent evolution, but um, was certainly reframed the way that we think about it, um, contributed some really important ideas, not just about the sort of hereditary of the in hereditary inheritance of information from parents to children, but the fact that that the material that was being inherited could accrue random variation. And that was really important. So random changes were creeping in there that could be beneficial, could be deleterious, and that natural selection could be very ruthless about distinguishing between those two. And he had a contemporary, Gregor Mendel, although the two never interacted, uh, who was also working on inheritance and who 
defined whatever it was that was being passed on as being very discrete units. So you had individual packages, I guess, that were being passed on. You had to fudge a bit of counting of peas to make everything work and all the rest of it. But the principles were, were phenomenal, what, what he worked out, that you were getting very discrete properties passed on from, from par parents to offspring. And so I guess, as I'm sure you all know, it, it took almost 100 years later but that people figured out that the what was actually being in inherited and the store of the information was, was DNA. And we have a phenomenal amount of DNA inside us. It's long and it's wriggly and it gets wrapped up tightly to fit inside our tiny little cells. But it's been estimated that in the average human, there's enough DNA in one person to stretch from the Earth to the Moon and back 1,500 times. Although, regrettably, the Apollo program was canned before they could actually conclusively prove that. Um, but there's a, just a vast amount of DNA. And the purpose of that DNA, it, DNA is kind of the rock star that gets all the attention. But that's like being super excited about your new CD. I'm old, a new CD, because it's all shiny, um, and, and not caring about the music that's in there, OK? I mean, I might be a little bit biased, because I work on proteins. Um, but really, proteins are where it's at. And DNA is just this boring old information store. And it's there to make the proteins, which then go on and do, or are, all of the key components of a cell and of your bodies, OK? And it's within the DNA, as Mendel had predicted, there are these discrete packages, the purpose of which is to encode an individual protein. OK, great. So what's, what's a protein? Um, well, I'm sure most of you are used to thinking of proteins as things like this, or I guess perhaps this is more your cup of soy chai latte, um, like this. But not all proteins are these big structural things, OK? In fact, very few are proteins that you're going to be able to visibly see. Things like your muscle fibers and all the rest of it can actually get long enough that you, you can, you know, and they can coalesce and, and you can visibly see them. But the vast majority of proteins that are inside your cells, you're never going to see. Uh, and they're basically individual little things called enzymes that catalyze the chemistry of life. And not all of you, but certainly the ones of my age and above are probably going to remember the, the hungry enzymes in the Drive commercial. Um, more or less how they look, not drawn to scale. Um, but <laughs> basically, these enzymes that have actually, they, they are genuinely enzymes that are put inside your laundry detergent. And the purpose of them, there's things called cellulases, there's things called lipases. There's some enzymes that can break down the fats that, that are staining your clothes. There's enzymes that can break down the cellulose and the grass stains on your clothes. And that's what those enzymes are actually doing in your detergent. So enzymes can be phenomenally useful sorts of things. And they don't just break stuff down, they build things as well. And they change one chemical into a, another chemical. Um, and they, they can't make any of this chemistry happen that wouldn't eventually happen if you were prepared to wait billions of years for it to happen. But they can be the difference between billions of years and just a few seconds to actually allow chemistry to happen in real time and allow life to continue. But biology, biology is a, a fundamentally sloppy thing. Um, and I shouldn't probably have to convince you guys of this. You're all made of biology, and you're probably well aware. Um, but the, the problem is it's just changing the whole time. And so even though DNA is this incredibly stable store of information, every time it replicates, it accrues a few new mutations. And there's nothing you can do to avoid that. There's certainly things you can do to make it worse. But short of stopping breathing oxygen and replicating your DNA, and I don't really advise doing either of those things, there's not a lot you can do. You're all sitting here mutating away, and frankly, it's disgusting. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but there's not much you can do. And what's happening is that you're getting individual changes to the bases that are present in your DNA that are the little bits that code, the variable bits that code for a protein. And so those random changes can lead to changes in the proteins that individual genes are encoding. And the good news is, most of the time, that doesn't do much at all. The bad news is that that can potentially, occasionally, cause disease. And here's a classic case of a recessive mutation, which doesn't do anything at all to the individual who get, gains the mutation, may not do anything to the partner who happens to have the same mutation, because they've, we've got two copies of all of our genes, so there's this built-in buffer for those types of mutations. But the dangerous and good aspect of that is that it actually allows our genes to evolve. You can get mutations in there that when combined might prove to be fabulous or might prove to be detrimental. And so these mutations can potentially cause disease downstream through inheritance. But that's very much a minority. Hardly any mutations will actually cause disease. And of those that do, our cells are pretty well programmed, our bodies are pretty well programmed to mop a lot of that disease up. So don't 
as I say, run home and stop breathing oxygen and, and replicating your DNA. But um, I don't know. I guess there's a lot of other mutations that can occur as well, and people are probably quite familiar with the, the difference between, I don't know, Jamie Foxx's soulful brown eyes and Tom Cruise's piercing, unhinged <laughs> blue eyes. Um, just a single point mutation in the DNA can be the difference between those. So you can get mutations that don't really well, I suppose under certain scenarios they affect your ability to reproduce, but shouldn't interfere with survival at least. Um, and then there's a vast number of mutations that don't do anything at all. Um, so even the difference between these two, um, when you look across their entire bodies and all of their cells, they will have hundreds and thousands of different mutations between these, these two individuals, almost all of which you just can't discern any detectable difference between them. But just very occasionally, you get these mutations which turn out to improve a valuable trait. Maybe it gives a dog, I don't know, twitchier leg muscles so they can run faster after prey, or uh, that's what I'm tapped out for examples right now. But, um, but you can actually get these beneficial mutations creeping in there. And I don't know how many people in this room, probably several, have tried to read Darwin's Origin of the Species. Some probably even finished it. Um, but it's, it's a tricky read. It's full of, I mean, this is probably about a tenth of the sentence that I took this excerpt from. So it's full of very long and meandering sentences. But if you look through, there are some real gems in those sentences. And really, the key elements of Darwin's entire theory of evolution are captured uh, in this phrase here. Okay, any amount of modification, essentially gain of genetic fitness or gain of fitness, accrues through the accumulation of numerous slight variations or mutations and critically as he defined them they occur through accidental events okay they can be bad a lot of the time they're neutral more often than not they're more often than being good they're bad but just occasionally they're profitable and he went on to describe how natural selection could sort through those mutations and cause the ones that are beneficial to be retained and be combined and organisms would improve their fitness over time and he also commented on people, because as we will see later, it's not just men who can do directed evolution, but the ability to replace natural selection with artificial selection and to actually very rapidly divert nature from its course or push nature into outcomes that left to its own devices might not be profitable, but are very profitable to, I don't know, medicine or industry or all kinds of things, really. So I guess what Darwin... Darwin was actually a pigeon fancier. He uh, made a lot of his initial observations around directing evolution uh, by pigeon breeding and noticing that you could get, in real time, you could actually select for very specific traits in, in these pigeons. Um, and of course, people have been doing this for a very, very long time. You know, the whole domestication of crops led to, I don't know, massive tomatoes that didn't contain anywhere near as many alkaloids, and corn that just sort of gets annoyingly stuck between your teeth instead of actively breaking them, like some of the precursors. So domestication of crops was driven, I guess, mostly by increased yield, by farmers keeping, retaining, and interbreeding the crops that were displaying the traits that they most wanted. Domestication of animals is a very similar story. Um, this is an early cave painting, apparently, depicting a dog, although it's a terrifying kind of thing. Um, and you can definitely see with dogs over the last just a few hundred years as people's priorities have changed and they haven't necessarily been breeding them exclusively for protection or for hunting or anything like that, we've had this proliferation of all sorts of weird and wacky breeds of dogs that frankly have no business existing um, as far as nature's <laughs> concerned. But, you know, they're cuddly and stuff. So, um, that's the power of replacing natural selection with artificial selection is, I guess, speeding evolution up from billions of years or thousands of years maybe to, to you know, something that can be achieved in more real time. But, and I'm undecided as to whether or not Francis um, Arnold and, and the two gentlemen, so Francis received 50% of this year's Nobel Prize award and the rest of Miranda was split between the two gentlemen around her. Um, and she's an absolute pioneer in the field of directed evolution speeding things up, not from millennia, but just down to individual days. And I'm a little bit, as I was saying, undecided as to whether it was a good thing for my talk or not that this Nobel Prize got announced a few days after I'd sent out the invites, making directed evolution sound like it was all about me, um, to have this pretty profound evidence that not only was I not a pioneer in directed evolution, I wasn't even an especially fast follower. Um, I guess I, I was a pioneer-ish for directed evolution in New Zealand, so we'll, we'll go with that. 
But I do have one claim to fame around Frances Arnold. Um, so where she wrote the book on directed evolution, which we bought and, and used in the lab, um, well, wrote, edited, um, I was actually involved in editing the sequel to her book. Um, so hers was in 2003. This one was, came out in 2015. So I confidently predict that in another 12 years or so, we're going to see another sequel. And uh, <laughs> we can see something like this. Anyway, um, France, I should, by rights too, be 36 times as likely as Frances to actually win a Nobel Prize. Um, she's only the fifth woman uh, to win a Nobel Prize for chemistry. Um, this year, Donna Strickland was awarded the third Nobel Prize in physics, so it's even more dire over in physics. And when you consider that 1903 and 1911, Marie Curie scooped two of those Nobel Prizes between chemistry and physics, it doesn't leave a whole lot of Nobels um, for the females after that. So it's, I think the climate is clearly changing, mm -hmm. take that multiple ways, but I think the scientific climate is, is changing to make the scientific environment less hostile to women, and I think at Victoria University, Grant, we've seen a lot of initiatives to try and promote that. But these statistics make it pretty stark that there's still a very long way to go uh, in science. As, so that covers the not a, a gentleman aspect, the not a scientist, but is actually also probably related in, in some manner, but she was referring there to the fact she's at Caltech, a very engineering heavy um, focused institution, and she was told a lot, she says, early in her career, that randomly mutating stuff and hoping for good things to happen is not science. So I'm hoping a few of those blokes are still around uh, at this point. Uh, we've been lucky enough, actually, me and some of the people in my lab, to meet Francis on several occasions. Um, was Monica, I saw you before, before I glazed over here. Um, first time, due to Monica, there's work uh, in bringing Francis out to our Queenstown Molecular Biology Conference um, here in New Zealand. Um, I then met her later that same year, I think at a conference in Hawaii, uh, and then this photo was taken just last year at a conference in Toulouse. Uh, so the, the photo op zooming in, you can see that we obviously all need our name tags, but Francis clearly doesn't. Um, actually, Alice, oh, I'll just point out while we're here, I'm going to, for people in my lab who are here, I'm, I've kind of done my best not to highlight individuals, although I couldn't resist at a few points, um, but I will just point out Abby, um, because she's submitting her thesis tomorrow, her PhD thesis. Um, she's setting two records in my lab for the fastest PhD thesis and the longest PhD thesis. <laughs> but she actually writes really well, so I can tell you that um, the length and the duration of her PhD are both uh, an excellent reflection on the work she's done, so yeah, great job, Abby. And Alistair's smiling because, frankly, he's lucky to be there at all. Uh, we just about <laughs> lost him forever the night before in this <laughs> restaurant in Toulouse. So, uh, anyway, um, so really, there were multiple key elements to this Nobel Prize winning idea of being able to direct evolution in, in very short periods of time. And one of those is that if there's only one trait that you care about, one activity that you're interested in, then there's no point trying to mutate an entire cell. Not no point, but it's going to take you a long time if you're trying to mutate an entire cell. Let's say it's a bacterial cell and you just mutate it and mutate it and you wait for it to do the thing that you want it to do. What you're essentially doing is throwing an enormous number of darts at a dartboard all at once and hoping one of them will strike the gene that you're interested in. And if you're lucky enough for that to happen, and even more lucky that you get a beneficial mutation out of it, you still probably won't see anything because all of those other darts are hitting somewhere in the bacterium and the bacteria is probably not going to be very happy about it. So it's a very inefficient way to, to drive mutation, uh, to drive evolution is just by mutating a cell over and over again. And one of the really clever aspects about this directed evolution is the idea of taking just a single gene that encodes the protein you're interested in, the enzyme that does the thing that you want it to do, and focusing all of your mutations just on that single gene and then you've got a much greater chance of, of picking out the beneficial mutations, popping that back inside a cell once, once you're done with introducing variation, and then applying your artificial selection. Now, another really clever aspect of the idea, and we're, um, Francis, to a lot of pioneering work, not just in ways of mutating genes and all the rest of it, but, but what you do next. And she did a lot of work um, with various bacteria and using them as hosts for this type of test tube evolution. And bacteria are fantastic for that. So they're small. Um, the typical size difference between a bacterial cell and one of your cells somewhere in your body is roughly the difference between an elephant and a mouse. Okay, so they're a lot less complicated. They're much smaller. They have much less DNA. 
and you're much more likely to see the outcome of a, a useful mutation, to actually just physically be able to detect it. Um, but bacteria are also really, really adept at taking up DNA. Not perhaps quite as adept as Kelsey and uh, Catherine might have liked, um, because they've been doing some directed evolution in my lab to really, I guess, probe the limits of the size of the libraries that you can make. And they were mutating, you know, 10 billion, creating libraries of 10 billion gene variants at a time and getting those inside bacteria. But that's really the upper limit of, well, what, what they were prepared to do anyway. And frankly, I think I was pushing my luck even, even getting them to go that far. But once your bacteria take up your foreign DNA, they will then start to divide. And this is incredibly useful for, for a laboratory evolution process, is that they will divide asexually. So one cell will become two, which will both be genetically identical to each other. Two will become four, four will become eight, and so on, and so on. And so they will, I guess, accrue chance variations themselves. But by and large, if you can just grow these bacteria <coughs> on a petri dish, they're just going to keep growing as long as the nutrients are there until you've got about 10 to the power of eight bacteria shy of a, a billion bacteria being there, and you can actually start to see them as individual colonies on a plate. And at this point, all of the bacteria, apart from very tiny chance mutations, are genetically identical to each other, except for the one gene variant that you've put in there. And if you screen for the one activity that you're interested in, then it's almost certainly, if you see something that you want, it's almost certainly going to be due to a beneficial mutation in the gene variant that you're interested in. So if you're if you are lucky, or if you're really clever, and you can design a way to put a, a compound in your growth medium that's going to be toxic to all of the bacteria except the ones that you really want, this may be all that you have to do. It may be that those individual colonies that are growing up, the ones that can survive, are the fittest and are the ones that you actually want to take forward. But more often than not, it's not that easy. Uh, and <laughs> You have to get Kelsey and Catherine to pick a whole bunch of colonies and other people in the lab. And so you can actually take these individual bacterial colonies one at a time, carefully toothpick them into a well of growth media, and you can grow up these massive parallel cultures of bacteria. And this is something we call a, a 96 well plate that I frequently threaten the students in, in my lab with. And you get these massively parallel cultures that you can then perhaps pop a chemical in and see if it changes colour to the thing that you want. Or there may be some other way of screening for the precise activity that you're interested in. Okay, so that's a lot of the background. Um, back to me. Um, I did my PhD with Professor Ian Lamont at the University of Otago. It wasn't on directed evolution, um, but what it did do was give me the ideal background for doing directed evolution. Ian taught me a lot about working with bacteria, about working with enzymes, and doing more traditional forms of enzymes, e enzyme engineering that left me sort of very well poised for the next step in my career to do some directed evolution. Uh, I didn't have the, an Abbey-style PhD. Um, I kind of had two Abbey-style PhDs without the long thesis. Um, but you can see the relief on Ian's face is actually pretty palpable that I actually finally got through there. Um, some people may also recognise Janine Kopp, um, who was Dr Janine Kopp, joined my lab as a postdoc uh, later on and contributed to a lot of the early work on directed evolution that we were doing back here in New Zealand as well. Um, what I was working with with Ian was on the enzymes that are responsible for making, making this um, compound called pyoverdin, which is a virulence factor that helps this bacterium Pseudomonas aeruginosa cause a variety of nasty diseases, opportunistic diseases, in people. And so we were studying this one molecule that it makes and the enzymes that are involved in synthesizing that molecule, which is beautiful in yellow and green, which comes up again later, and fluorescent and pretty doesn't, but it's kind of cool. Um, I was really lucky, too, to have some fantastic friends as I was coming through. Um, this top one's a little bit of a cheat. It was actually taken a couple of years after my PhD at the University of Cambridge, but I did want to include it because of uh, now Associate Professor Wayne Patrick lurking up the back. Can't quite see his ponytail, unfortunately. I think, is that part of it there, Wayne? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, you can also tell who was living in California at the time versus who was living in <laughs> um, Cambridge, but yeah, oh, good university, I hear. Um, I had some other very good friends, Scott, my long-term bridge partner, Ross, I don't know, long-term troublemaker, I guess. Um, but those two combined, uh, they were actually both my best men at, at my wedding, but they combined to make my PhD take at least two years longer than Alan here, who's now off being a VP of something important in Fonterra. I'm sure those guys were probably all the difference. Uh, Karen and Sarah really saved my bacon, um, helping me format all my references and my PhD by hand. So I don't want to hear any complaining about EndNote, you lot. Um, that's the way we used to do things, uh, or at least 
where we used to get Karen and Sarah to do things. Um, and then Ollie, Alex, professors at the University of Western Australia, Tom runs the synchrotron. I felt like I was part of a really special generation coming through the biochem department and I've always been grateful. I've usually been grateful looking back. Um, one thing I'm extraordinarily grateful for, and I think this owes a lot to Ian's skills as a um, reference writer, uh, is that I got the first job that I happened to apply for. I had no idea what I was really going to do, and I was just bumbling along, and it comes as a little bit of a shock, actually, at the end of a PhD to discover that you're actually still not employable, um, or at least not if you want a traditional academic career path. So you can earn less. I don't, anyway, let's not. Um, anyway, so I was very lucky to get this um, postdoc at uh, Stanford with Professor A.C. Mateen, uh, who just acquired a big Department of Energy grant seeking to engineer superior enzymes for detoxification of this widespread environmental pollutant called hexavalent chromium. Um, this is A.C.'s wife Mimi, who was in the lab, so she was his lab manager, and A.C. and Mimi were just, they were really good to me, so I'm very grateful for, uh, well, everything they did for me and allowed me to do at Stanford. I'm also enormously grateful to the people that I shared the lab with. Um, so very lucky in the people that I was there. Uh, this is Clau, or Associate Professor Claudio Gonzalez at the University of Florida, um, one of the University of Floridas. Um, Sue Lynch, Gainesville, that's the one he's at. Uh, Sue Lynch, who's now, she's just phenomenal. She's um, got in early on the microbiome revolution and really drove a lot of it forward. Um, she's been full professor uh, at University of California, San Francisco for a while now. Um, and that's one of the world's very top medical schools. And this is her husband, Owen, who's uh, high up at Lawrence Livermore um, Labs. He's in the climate change area, which probably isn't that comfortable a place to be right now, um, but it's a reflection of the fantastic uh, work that he's been doing. Um, I managed to make some friends outside of the lab while I was in the, this is in the San Francisco Bay Area as well. Um, I've been lucky to always be an incredibly gifted sportsman. Um, here's the bloody short shorts and the nomads again. Um, and so I was able to sort of parlay that into to meeting a whole bunch of people. Um, turns out though that just because you're a Kiwi, it doesn't actually make you automatically good at rugby. Uh, this is me, number seven, not even getting close to the 70 year old bloke who's on the other, <laughs> other team, which actually was the way I liked it. But um, you can tell I got a little bit sick of winning the Charlie of the Day prize uh, just from the expression of my, they didn't call it that, but I'll, I'll spare you the um, details. But luckily, I never won the prize for scoring a try. Uh, so Owen, who was a far better rugby player and actually represented Ireland uh, in the youth grades, well, yeah, <laughs> lucky. And yes, that boot was actually worn during the game. I had a lot more luck with hockey, so going back to hockey, um, both at competitive and social levels. Um, and part of the reason that hockey was so fantastic is that it's not a bloke's sport in the US at all. Um, so none of these guys were American. Um, a lot of the women were. It's kind of a Title IX thing, so trying to get a balance between the number of sports uh, at college that are, that are funded for, for men and, and women. Um, but what it meant, it sounds ridiculous to, this is far and away the highest level of hockey I've played my entire life, uh, and it's because hockey wasn't a, a men's sport. Um, and we were living in the Bay Area, we were living in Silicon Valley where there were all these programmers who had come there for work. We had guys who had represented their countries, at least at age group level, uh, from eight different countries. And some of them were Ghana and Ireland, which aren't exactly hockey powerhouses, but other ones were Australia and the UK and Germany. So they had some phenomenal players, but they didn't have enough of them. And so they needed a few more mugs who at least knew which end of a stick to, to pick up and run around. And so as a consequence, I got all these great opportunities that I would have never had back in New Zealand, um, playing against, for example, the visiting, um, the touring Australian Masters side, which included a bunch of guys who at the very start of their careers had been playing against my, my uncle Paul. Uh, or we had a whole series of games against the US women's team um, while they were in a training camp over in California uh, until we actually beat them once and then we didn't get invited back. Uh, and it's, Lest it sound like I'm bragging, I would like to emphasize that I had no business being on the same park as any of these people, but they really needed someone there to, to make up the numbers. Had a huge number of friends um, through hockey and, and grateful to have you know, spent time with these people there. And of course, no matter where you go, there's bloody Kiwis everywhere. Uh, and I'm hugely grateful for that. In fact, I was very lucky when I was looking for somewhere to live uh, to bump into Alison, uh, who was a Kiwi who was looking for a, a flatmate at the time. Uh, and she had this fantastic, she was great. She had this fantastic friend, Daryl, who's just an amazing human being. And um, I'm always going to remember this wonderful trip we had driving almost the entire way down the Baja Peninsula for, for New Year's, Christmas and New Year's one year. My outdoorsmanship got called into question once again, but we're sleeping on bloody rocks, for God's sake. I mean, <laughs> I 
Yeah, thank you. Um, Joe and Tony, I actually knew Tony, so he was a mate of my mate, Ross, the one who ended up being one of my best men at, at my wedding. Uh, and this is his wife, Joe Montgomery, who's now, I think, still Associate Professor Montgomery at the University of Auckland. But if she is, it can't be very long, because she's, again, just got an absolutely stellar CV, way, way better than mine. So if she's not Professor yet, it's certainly not going to be very long. Uh, and Professor Tahu Kukatai, some people will know Tahu, uh, who's a Professor of Demography at the University of Waikato. I'm just very lucky to have met these people. <laughs> what was I actually supposed to be doing? Well, um, I guess what I was hired to do, as I said, was to try and develop some enzymes to evolve some enzymes that would be capable of detoxifying this widespread environmental pollutant. And it was very topical at the time because Julia Roberts, thankfully, had just won the Best Actress Oscar for portraying Erin Brockovich. Um, so Erin Brockovich, this is the real Erin Brockovich, um, former beauty queen turned environmental crusader and, and legal crusader, who was instrumental in bringing about a $333 million payout, at its time the largest ever environmental settlement, from Pacific Gas and Electric, who had been using hexavalent chromium as a rust inhibitor in their coolant towers, and had been dump dumping it in some unlined ponds. Okay, so just sort of bare soil ponds that were about five miles away from this township, Hinkley. But what no one really knew is that the aquifer that was the primary township water supply sort of extended the whole way under those ponds, and so the chromate didn't really have very far to diffuse to, to get into that water supply. <coughs> and during the, the lawsuit, it was just uncontestable that the chromate had gotten into the water supply and that it had been PG&E who, who put it in there. So most of the focus of the defence was more around, well, hexavalent chromium can't have caused all these things, and. Um, so I spoke to a guy who was an expert witness there, and one of the key parts of the defence rested on the fact that hexavalent chromium is very easily reduced to trivalent chromium, chemically. Uh, in fact, that's actually the basis of the, the blow-in-a-bag breathalyzer test, is that you have this yellow hexavalent chromium, and even just the alcohol in your breath can be sufficient to reduce that to the, the far less toxic, or at least less bioavailable, um, green chromium-3 form. And so the argument was made that when these people were drinking the water, the contaminated water, that it was just being reduced immediately by their stomach acid. And that there's no way that they could have suffered the ill consequences of, of hexavalent chromium. And we all want to put chromium in our various micronutrient vitamin blah blahs so, you know, it's probably doing them some good. Um, and actually that gotcha moment in the film, for those of you who have seen it, where Erin Brockovich basically tells them that they've been drinking away on water from the township's water supply, apparently actually happened. Um, they, she actually served the water and, and they weren't that amused by it. So it kind of goes to show they weren't exactly practicing what they preach. Um, the guy I spoke to, his pet theory was that, um, that people were actually being exposed to it by breathing in steam and things in the shower, and they were, it was actually the lungs would have been a primary route of exposure. But even without that, I mean, all of the tissues in your mouth and in your esophagus before you get to your stomach, it's taken up very quickly, and it's it's very, very nasty thing. Um, weirdly, around about 2008, I don't know if anyone remembers, but we had Erin Brockovich here in New Zealand um, doing a bunch of ads for Noel Leeming, which had absolutely no relation to it. It was very weird. Um, and then... Um, she got very peeved with Noel Leeming because the sister company Bond and Bond ran a series of ads at the same time that unflatteringly compared women to refrigerators and she was not happy and it turns out Erin Brockovich isn't a good person to piss off in that kind of context so they settled out of court and we, we haven't seen her back again. Um, the Department of Energy who were funding my postdoc uh, were really interested in uh, reducing hexavalent chromium because they've made a big mess of a lot of um, the US. And so hexavalent chromium is a byproduct of many, many industries, but it's also a major byproduct of nuclear weapons production. And just owing to that cause alone, uh, at the time that I was there, which is, you know, when I first got there over 15 years ago now, um, it was estimated to be a $2 trillion problem just to tidy up these sites alone. So there was a lot of interest in finding affordable ways of doing that. And what we call tidying up those sites was basically going to be chemical reduction of the hexavalent chromium, which was going to completely sterilise the soil and um, have all sorts of nasty flow-on consequences. And so what they were at least interested in investigating the possibility of, not very committal there, but um, was whether or not it would be possible to evolve biological systems to more cost-effectively and more efficiently re remediate this problem. And to be honest, we know a bit more about how fast evolution, evolution can move now, and I'm not sure I buy this final line, but luckily AC's grant funding panel did. Um, but the argument was made that bacteria might be really good at doing this, but they just haven't had time to evolve enzymes that would be good at, at reducing this hexavalent chromium. 
And so he had shown that he had found an enzyme from some bacteria from some chromate contaminated water, which was able to reduce hexavalent chromium to this non-toxic trivalent form. Um, but it, and it, he had also shown that it could defend the bacterium against the toxicity of the, the hexavalent chromium. So the idea was it wasn't very good. Could we evolve this enzyme to be far more efficient? And if you're going to do this type of lab-based in vitro evolution, you need some way of monitoring the activity that you're interested in. And luckily for us, hexavalent chromium can be easily reacted with a second chemical to give this bright pink color. And so the idea was that we could basically mutate the gene that encoded the enzyme that we were starting with, just sprinkle it with mutations, pop those back into some E. coli bacterial cells. We would then burst for a variety of reasons. We had to burst them open. It's in italics, so you know it's significant later on. But we would burst them to release those enzymes, added in a few of the bits and pieces they needed to work, uh, and then added the hexavalent chromium. And we could look at individual wells to see how much chromium was left after a set period of time. And if those wells were bright pink, none of the chromium had been converted, so it wasn't an enzyme that we wanted. But if we had these white wells, all of the chromium had been used up. And so those were the bacteria that we wanted um, and the enzymes that we were interested in. And it worked really, really well. I have to say, um, toothpicking individual colonies, it doesn't sound like it takes very long to just pick a colony and put it in a plate and move on, but it takes about 10 seconds probably per go. And if you multiply that by 2,000, that's actually a really, really boring day, a um, couple of days maybe. And if your boss tells you to do it time and time again, you start to think about other career options. Um, but it was working, and it worked really, really quickly. There was a problem though, a bit of a hitch, and this is one of Francis Arnold's famous aphorisms, is you get what you screen for. And when I first heard that, I was like, oh, thanks very much. That's great. Um, but it turns out she actually means it's more like a deal with the devil or Aladdin and the genie, that you have to be very, very careful about what you're asking for, because if there's any wiggle room, evolution's gonna go the way you don't want it to. Um, and what happened for us is because we were bursting our bacterial cells to release the enzyme and they were working in this free sort of uninhibited environment, we definitely evolved much better chrom chromate reducing enzymes. But when we put them back inside the bacterium that they'd started with, those bacteria were only very marginally improved in their ability to reduce hexavalent chromium. And it appeared that the limiting factor now was their ability, the rate at which they could actually take it up. And it was useful for a variety of applications to have enzymes that were good in and of themselves, but we hadn't met the primary goal, which was to make a better chromium reducing um, bacteria. So we did get a couple of patents out of it and people were sort of marginally interested in it for a while, but I think that's really sort of died out. But the really key thing that I took away from the whole process was that you need to be really, really careful about the way that you design a directed evolution experiment. And even if you are super careful, then evolution can still find a way to, to trip you up. So doing it again, there's probably a lot of things that, that I would do differently. Um, but being the man that I am, I left that as someone else's problem and took a job back in Wellington. Um, we're not quite done with the Bay Area yet, though, because I did accept the job back here. But there was a, a complicating factor uh, in that I'd met a girl. Um, and she was staying over there. So I took the job here. Um, she was over there. We sorted things out eventually. But actually, the entire process was a little bit fraught. Um, we've got Sue here, um, so she's, sorry, Professor Susan Lynch, world leading professor at the University of California, San Francisco, one of the world's top medical schools. Um, this is actually the very party where Sue realized that I was fond of Joanna, um, but she, got, she had no time for me being too timid to ask her out, so she literally drove me into the kitchen where Joanna was on her own with a broom on the end of a broom handle, and she slammed the door shut, and neither of us was allowed out until I had a date. Um, <laughs> So it worked out, <laughs> and luckily Joanna's terrified of Sue, <laughs> so she even agreed when I proposed. She was no way she was going to deal with Sue and come back and said that hadn't worked out. Uh, and so although I was over in New Zealand in 2006 starting the biotechnology program over here, and Joe was finishing up her postdoc at, at Stanford, uh, sorry, at UCSF at that, at that point, um, we got married halfway through that year. I uh, had a wonderful honeymoon in Mexico. There's Scott and Ross, uh, Joanna's flanked by her two sisters. Um, and then I got to go from a honeymoon in Mexico back to Wellington winter uh, and do my brand new second year teaching, which I hadn't done any preparation for. So it was a bit of a rough ride. It was probably the best time to be apart, frankly. But um, we've worked it out subsequently. I don't know if anyone has 
stumbled across this Wayback Machine. It's a bit of a nasty piece of work, um, but it's basically the entire internet is archived. They've got these robots that crawl around and they take snapshots of the entire internet. And so I was able to go back and actually find my original job application um, that, that I'd applied for. And so I applied in the middle of 2004. I got the job, um, I think, at the very end or at the very start of 2005. Due to my skilled negotiations, I thought, uh, I managed to negotiate staying uh, in Stanford for an extra year so I could, you know, so that Joe and I wouldn't have to spend two years apart. Uh, it turned out, I realised later, they got all of their teaching out of me and only had to pay me six weeks' salary, so <laughs> I'm not a very skilled negotiator. Um, but anyway, there we go. Um, but I am extremely grateful, nonetheless, to the guys who took advantage of me retrospectively, um, <laughs> to Charlie Doherty, who was the head of school at the time that I applied for the job, and Paul Tiers, who was the head of school by the time I arrived back in 2005 for that whirlwind teaching experience. I'm enormously grateful, and I can't overstate it, to um, Paul Atkinson and Bill Jordan uh, for being very welcoming when I first arrived there, um, but also working incredibly hard um, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes occasionally to help Joanna um, land a job at, at ESR with Diana Martin uh, working on meningococcal disease. She's an actual microbiologist who solves real-world problems. Um, but really, really grateful to you guys for helping us work that out. Hugely grateful to my colleagues at the time as well. Um, John and Anne, who were and have remained incredibly welcoming. Um, Mary, well, you just can't say enough about Mary. and it's Completely bulletproof, still looks exactly the same. Um, Sandra, you weren't actually there then. I went back and checked, but I managed to steal your photo from 2007. I can't imagine Mary without you and vice versa, so you're in there. Um, and Leslie, who helped me settle in and, and get things sorted. Now, I really tried hard to find a few more photos of people in the department, but there are only two more that I can find. So I guess the big question is, for those of you here, do you feel lucky? <laughs> These were the ones that I was able to find. So <laughs> Darren Day and Professor Phil Lester. Thank me later, Phil. A um, few more of these guys that I couldn't find, but still catch up with when I can at the pickle jar. Um, yeah, thanks very much for those of you who have made it along, and certainly appreciate your company when I, when I can make it out there. Okay, what was I doing in California? I eventually kind of got to it. What was I doing when I set up my lab? Well, I had two really big ideas that I wanted to found my lab on, and unusually, um, they both kind of worked out. They're still the two mainstays of my research today. Um, and so the first of these was the idea that I wanted to be able to engineer some enzymes to improve cancer gene therapy. And what that idea is based around is the fact that there's a whole bunch of different microbes, various viruses, various bacteria, that for one reason or another have a much easier time infecting cancerous cells than they do healthy cells. And it's kind of attractive in some regards because they will potentially add some extra effect to traditional chemotherapies and, and radiotherapies. So there's the potential to just kind of boost those things as getting a leg in the door for this exciting new type of treatment. Um, I'll just give a couple of examples. So all of those different viruses and bacteria can um, preferentially infect cancerous cells in different kind of ways. Um, adenovirus, so viruses are really different to bacteria. They're much smaller and they're not free living. Okay, they're really just a collection of molecules that have gotten together and have found that if they can parasitize a living cell, they can actually use it, they can take over the machinery to, to replicate themselves. And our cells don't like that. They don't want to be turned into a viral factory. And so they have certain defenses against viruses doing that. And so when adenovirus infects a healthy cell, it has to secrete a couple of, it basically turns into a race. It has to secrete a couple of factors that will shut down those defenses. And so you can see, automatically, adenovirus might have an easier time infecting a cancerous cell, which actually has to lose those very same defenses as part of transitioning from a healthy cell to, to a malignant state. Okay, so it's easier already. But if you can then engineer that adenovirus by taking away the the things that it produces to neutralize the defenses of those healthy cells, then you've got something that should only be able to replicate in the cancerous cells that have lost those defenses. That's kind of complicated and it doesn't actually work anywhere neatly uh, in, in reality as you would hope, but you can engineer these viruses to be much more specific for cancerous cells. Or you can have bacteria, which can also preferentially infect cancerous cells. So Clostridium is a genus of different types of bacteria that are what we call obligate anaerobes. They can only grow in the absence of oxygen. And when oxygen is present, they will form this very thick spore coating that will defend them against, against the elements. So there's Clostridium botulinum, which some of you might have heard of. Um, it's the reason that you don't want to eat food from a dented tin, because if there's been any impairment to the integrity of that tin, 
and this bacterium can potentially get inside there, there will be very, very little oxygen on the inside and it's free to multiply throughout the food. And Clostridium botulinum produces botulinum toxin, which is one of the nastiest toxins known to people. It's an incredibly powerful, well, muscle relaxant and amongst other things, which is why people apparently, I don't know why people, don't know, anyway, but apparently it's very effective. Um, maybe I'll rethink my stance on it in a few more years. Uh, and then there's Clostridium perfringens, which is the, the causative agent of gas gangrene. Um, and again, it can only cause gangrene, and it's the traditional um, cause of gangrene is when you've had a, I don't know, you're trapped under a, a fallen log or a stone or something, and so you've had this major crushing injury which has cut off the blood supply to your limbs. And at that point, there's no oxygen getting to the limbs, so Clostridium perfringens can potentially infect you. But in a healthy person, there's basically nowhere that these spores can go to to allow the bacterium to replicate uh, that's safe for the bacterium. But at the core of a solid tumour, once the tumour gets big enough and it's accruing mutations and it's outstripping its blood supply, you will very often get this necrosis in this dead centre where there's no oxygen and the bacteria can, can multiply. So that's one way that Clostridium can potentially target these solid tumours. The problem is that Clostridium won't, it will munch away perhaps at the dead and dying tissue at the core of a solid tumour, but it, it won't actively go out there and kill it for you. Or these viruses that by the time we've engineered them to be very, very precise for the cancerous tissue, and you want to do that before you go injecting a dangerous pathogen into a very sick patient, um, it's basically going to have a hard time killing even the tumour cells. But it is potentially quite good at targeting them and getting to them and replicating itself. And so the idea behind this type of gene therapy is that we can potentially arm these bacteria or these viruses with genes that are going to improve their potency, improve their ability to kill these cancerous cells. And you want to be really careful about how you do that. You could potentially put in a gene that's going to give a bacterium the ability to make ricin or some really, really toxic protein, but you're essentially creating a bioweapon, okay? And at some point, it's going to get out. You're only going to have Will Smith left on the world. And worse, you're probably going to have a really hard time getting your funding application across the line. Uh, and so the solution to that is rather than having something that's directly toxic, you try and engineer an enzyme to be conditionally toxic, something that will be completely safe in nature, but may be capable of converting a very artificial compound from a non-toxic to a toxic state. And that was a lot of the work that we've been doing, is basically uh, in the early years of my lab, uh, is, and I'll, I'll just thank some of the people who really did the foundational work, um, Janine, who I've mentioned, Gareth, who was my second ever PhD student, um, and they did a huge amount of work building this collection of enzymes and setting up some of the tools that we would actually use to evolve those enzymes subsequently to marry them up with these prodrugs that our collaborators at the Auckland Cancer Society Research Centre had developed to be really, really good at going from a non-toxic to a toxic state when a nitro group got reduced by our nitro reductase enzymes, not very imaginatively named. Um, Elsie also used these tools a lot and set up a large number, together with Janine, of various libraries that we're still using today and that we're still finding interesting things from. Um, so I'm very grateful to those, those early researchers in my lab. And I don't have time, well, I don't have time at all, um, but I will, will speed things up. But um, very quickly just tell you about one aspect is that's really cool about them. I think about these enzymes is not just their ability to take these toxins, to activate these toxins, but they can also reduce nitro groups on other things. And these molecules are really interesting because you can radio label them and you can consume them orally, and within about 20 minutes, all of it will be in your bladder unless the nitro group has been reduced, in which case that compound gets stuck inside the cell where it was reduced. And so it's a really, really good way of telling you where your virus or where your bacterium is if you've labelled it with one of these nitroreductase enzymes. So the idea is that you can potentially pop your patient um, inside a PET machine and get a very clear image of your virus only being in the tumour and not in the healthy tissues before you administer the drug. I would like to say that's our image, but I've shamelessly stolen it from Wikipedia. Um, ours don't look anything like that pretty, but we're hoping that we can kind of resolve that. We've got some collaborators at the University of Nottingham and the University of Maastricht who have raised several million euros to actually start taking this thing through late stage preclinical testing uh, and we hope ultimately into phase one clinical trials uh, in cancer patients. I'm really getting short on time so I'm going to race through this, um, but I will just tell you about the second big research theme in my lab where we've been using directed evolution, which is on these unpronounceable enzymes called NRPSs. Um, non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. 
So these proteins that I've been talking to you about are built off a machine called a ribosome, all of them pretty much. To go from DNA to a protein, you need a ribosome at some part, part along the pathway. But these enzymes are really neat. They can make proteins, or at least protein-like molecules, independent of the ribosome. But, so it's proteins that can actually build other proteins, uh, which is kind of cool. And they do so in a Lego-like fashion. So they will basically recognize one amino acid, it's a Lego building block of a protein, and join it to another and to another. And the neat thing about that is that whereas the ribosome can only use 20 different amino acids, these enzymes can use five or 600 different amino acids. So it gives you access to a vast array of alternative LIGO building blocks that you can find in pyoverdin, that molecule that I was studying for my PhD, uh, or an enormous range of uh, antibiotics upon which we're absolutely dependent. And the cool thing about the way I seem to be saying that a lot. One of the fascinating things um, about the way that these enzymes work is that they're very modular and they act like an assembly line. And it's very, very clear that nature has successfully, time and time again, swapped out part of the assembly line, just swapped out a module and popped a new module in there and has changed a group in the antibiotic to evade resistance that a different bacterium might have developed. Okay, so if you've got this really good weapon and some other bacterium that you're trying to bonk over the head with it becomes resistant to it, you can change your weapon and, I don't know, whack it in the stomach instead. But, you know, um, just by changing a few of these groups in your antibiotics, you can, um, and people have been wanting to do this for a very long time, so that obviously with antibiotic resistance being a huge problem worldwide, to be able to re-engineer these antibiotics so that they can evade existing re resistance mechanisms, existing forms of resistance, um, would be very, very beneficial. The problem is that although nature has clearly done it time and time again, it turns out to be very difficult to swap these components around and have them retain activity. So, We've taken this reductionist approach to it. Um, this isn't a very scientific drawing of an enzyme, so I've replaced it with a far more scientific one. Um, I'm really grateful to Jeremy, uh, who was my first PhD student, who introduced this model enzyme to our lab. It's much smaller than the other NRPSs, and it allowed us to basically focus on just a single module that would nonetheless produce a visible compound. So this thing basically takes glutamine, it bends it into a cycle, sticks two of those cycles together, and makes a blue pigment that you can readily detect. And this gave us the ability to do all kinds of tinkering with these enzymes, make them stop working, we're really, really good at that, uh, and then evolve them until they worked again. And now we're using directed evolution not to make anything useful, but just to fundamentally understand how these enzymes work and what the key bits are that allow different parts of the enzyme to communicate. Okay, so we could mutate them until they restored activity, and we could select for appearance of these blue colonies on a plate, and then take a look at what those mutations had been. Okay, I'm going to zoom on through, um, but I will just say briefly on the way, because this is really pretty and it was on the invite that went out, um, we were able to combine those indigoidine producing bacteria with my original Pseudomonas aeruginosa producing this pigment. Uh, it's kind of cool because the pseudom oh, there we go again. Uh, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa was um, actually killing the E. coli, so you get this really nice effect around New Zealand. Um, just a huge shout out to Mark who tolerated me making him try time and time and time again to get a really pretty picture of New Zealand uh, and eventually got us on the cover of this really nice journal. So some days it's easier to be the boss than it is to be the, the guy streaking out bacteria time and time again. Um, I am not going to have time to go through Jeremy's work. Um, you will be hearing from Jeremy, I imagine, in very short order up the front giving his own professorial lecture. Um, but I've been very grateful to be able to contribute to the work that he's been doing, uh, recovering new antibiotics from bacteria-rich samples, which includes soil, which is where we found most of the antibiotics to date. And Jeremy's basically addressing the problem that in the 50s, 60s, 70s, people just went to soil time and time again. They got, eventually started finding the same antibiotics time and time again. And then with the molecular biology revolution in the early 2000s, people realized they weren't actually accessing all of the bacteria that were there. They were only really accessing about 1% of them. And we just couldn't grow the other 99% in the lab to find out what antibiotics they were making. And Jeremy has come up with this really clever way of just basically not trying to grow the bacteria, just taking the DNA that's there and finding the gene clusters that you're interested in and putting them in a bacterium that you can grow in the lab. So you start at these very competitive, bacteria-rich um, environments, soil, wet socks, which turns out are actually very scientific things. Uh, and you can extract all of the DNA that's there. You can put them in your bacteria. We've been involved in developing ways of actually finding the gene clusters that you're interested in uh, and then making new antibiotics in that manner. 
the really obvious thing that so obvious that only took us about four or five years to think of is that if you've got an enzyme that can turn glutamine into a blue pigment and people care about measuring glutamine, it's like, oh wait, we could take a look at how blue things go and we could figure out, <laughs> honestly, it took us so long, it's just ridiculous. And one of the ridiculous aspects is that when we actually finally filed a patent around it, we won the patent race, but only because we filed six days before someone else who I had was presumably even dumber than us about. Uh, anyway, um, we've been on the wrong side of many patent races, so it was good to finally notch a win. Um, just closing things. I guess Francis Arnold's companions, um, whatever, colleagues at Caltech would, would have said just randomly mutating things isn't science. What a lot of them were probably doing was this rational design approach where you spend an inordinate amount of time purifying an enzyme, crystallizing it, figuring out its structure through some incredibly complicated maths, and then trying to make very precise changes that turn out not to work um, the way that you'd hoped they would. But if they do work, and then that's really the sort of the Shakespeare approach to this. Whereas our preferred approach is just these millions of monkeys hammering away on typewriters and hoping they eventually come up with something. But I can't help but feel that Mr. Darwin would have uh, preferred our approach uh, to the whole thing. Okay, I'm just going to end. I am honestly ending. Sorry, Dave. Um, you know what it's like when you're a kid and you're pretty convinced that the last four billion years or so of evolution have been there to produce you. And, um, well, you grow up, you get disillusioned, you realise that's not the case, and you discover that actually the whole purpose of evolution has been to produce these guys. Um, so I think, frankly, it was well worth it. Time well spent. Um, thanks for your help. Joanna. <laughs> um, and I'll just show you this picture, I guess. This is more for my dad than anyone else, is to show the kids with one of their great, 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 great ancestors um, having a good time. Um, I do have to be grateful to the people who have funded the work, uh, as Grant named them already, so I won't spend too much time on it, but I, I just like this picture. I, I don't know, I guess they're the ones that allow us to rise up. And, uh, I haven't got time to finish that anyway. Um, a lot of friends who I'm very grateful for, and don't have time to explain, but I will just say um, Jeff Mum is actually out here next week. He's just a wonderful guy. Um, he makes science fun again. Um, he's just really, really fun to work with. Um, and he's found these other uses for nitroreductase enzymes, which we're really interested in. He's giving a seminar here on November the 6th for anyone who would like to come and hear about that. And to the rest of you, um, you know who you are or you know who you are if you're watching this on the webcast. And thanks very much. And I'm just going to leave this slide up, um, but enormously grateful to the Hannah's mums who are in the room or any other mums and dads who are here, um, thank you so much for lending me your offspring. Um, I've been incredibly privileged. I've been so lucky with the people who have been in, in my lab. Um, and yeah, just wonderful people. And I will just leave this up here so you can appreciate how wonderful they are. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. And Dave, sorry for yeah, probably challenging your record. <laughs>